we are thrilled um, to conclude this one of a kind festival with um, a one of kind one of a kind film. Uh, our closing night film is the world premiere of French Exit, directed by Azazel Jacobs, and I'm really thrilled to have these wonderful guests um, with me on this press conference today. Uh, I'll do a quick round of introductions. Um, we have the director of the film, um, Azazel Jacobs. Welcome. We also have the screenwriter, Patrick DeWitt, who also wrote the novel on which the film is based. And we have uh, the two wonderful actors who are the center of the film, um, Michelle Pfeiffer, who plays Francis, and Lucas Hedges, who plays Malcolm. Thank you so much to all of you for being with us today. Uh, I'm gonna start with a question for, for Aza, if you could. I know that you and Patrick, uh, you go pretty far back. You're longtime friends and, and collaborators. Um, could you tell us what, what drew you to French Exit as a book to adapt? Um, because reading the book, it seems like a tricky proposition in some ways. Um, and I think what you've done with this film is, is not just adapt uh, a story, a narrative, but something more elusive. You've kind of adapted uh, an entire tone, maybe an entire way of seeing the world. Well, I could say that I can only answer that in kind of retrospect now that I'm on the other side of making it. Because really, when I read the book, I didn't, at the moment I closed it, um, I read it in a day and called Patrick immediately after finishing the last page and asked him if I could make a film out of it. So it really was on instinct, was my desire. And then I think the process of making the film, trying to figure out, okay, what is it? that I connected, why, why did I connect to this world, which is so far away from my own? Definitely the, the, the humor and the humanity of Patrick's writing drew me in immediately, like as it always does. Um, but why this particular story, I think um, has been, had, was the question that kind of motivated and excited me and tried to figure out, um, you know, the, the way that I could answer in this, uh, in this, in this film. I think that if I think about like the things now in retrospect, like I definitely, I love Bunuel. I love, um, you know, rules of the game. Like I see, I see stories about class is something that draws me in. And when I think about the films that uh, Lucas and Michelle, we all talked about in terms of like uh, um, Playtime and King of Comedy and uh, Trouble in Paradise, the, all these films I, I realized in retrospect are kind of all about class and the idea that there's this sense of theatrics that happens when people get um, packed in the room at all different levels in the kind of socioeconomic and what happens when things shift in their lives. So that's kind of me looking now, really just finishing the film kind of this week, starting to sink it in and kind of understanding like, okay, um, that was a huge attraction. And then in terms of the personal connection, I think, um, you know, of, of going through looking at the film now in terms of just like, uh, you know, the idea of what do I, what would I be like if I didn't exist with something like a core element, like film, like that's something that I, I can relate to now. You know, it's definitely one of those things that keeps me up at night. Like what if I wasn't able to make movies anymore and I can, I could feel what that would, or that's one of the things that really scares me of who am I without this thing that I love so much. So that is another way that I, really, again, looking back at the film that I can see how I can connect in a personal way with Francis's story in particular. Mm -hmm. um, Patrick, could I um, maybe ask you to say a little bit about the process of uh, translating the world of French Exit to the screen. I mean, you've um, you're a novelist, but you've also written for the screen. You wrote the the, the screenplay for for Terry, one of mm. his previous films. Um, so I'm just wondering if um, uh, just if you could say more about the process of turning it into a screenplay. Sure. Um, I'd never written a screenplay before Terry, and that was um, adapted from unpublished work of mine, which Aza saw a film in, and he encouraged me to write the screenplay, and he essentially taught me how to do it. My work is very dialogue heavy, and most of the um, stories are told by the participants in the story. So even though there's a, there's a narrative voice in French Exit, it wasn't that tricky because so much of the, um, 
so much of what occurs occurs, you know, in, in, through the conversations of the of the protagonists. And um, Aza was there every step of the way to help me shape the script. He 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 was. I I really enjoy collaborating with Azazel because we're such good pals, so it's very comfortable. But I also he's just a helpful presence. You know, it's um, sometimes notes and. Um, concerns about a work in progress can be cloying or difficult or frustrating and that's very rarely the case with Oz. I think we had one argument and uh, which is not that bad you know for an entire screenplay one argument is a pretty good so anyway um, do you remember what the argument was about Patrick the ending yeah the ending it was about the, <laughs> the final scene which I in my mind wanted to be Endings are always very difficult, probably for everyone, but it's it's sort of the bane of my existence as a writer. The endings are always just really hard. Goodbyes are difficult. And um, I had it in my mind that the ending of the book should be the ending of the film, which, of course, the novelist would think that, right? But Ozzo sort of gently pushed me away from it and pushed me away. And the gentleness became less gentle, and I think he was becoming a little bit frustrated with me. We'd been sort of locked in a room for several days, and it was snowing here in New York, and I was grouchy because I didn't have time to go to the museum because I thought we'd be done with the script sooner. Anyway, uh, Ozzy was right and I was wrong, but I did call him a couple names. I think I yelled, actually yelled at him and called him a, a bad this word. What's that? It's your apology? No, I, I, I'm sorry. I apologize in front of the whole world. I, 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 I'm apologizing. But um, all this to say, collaborating with Azazel is, is it, you know, it's always going to be work collaboration. It's always, and it's, challenging for somebody who typically works alone and in some ways prefers working alone but he's a good collaborator and he's supportive in all the right ways but he's also tough when he needs to be so uh, the sense that I have especially after doing this with Terry is just that I'm in good you know I'm in good hands with Aza and he's not gonna do anything I don't necessarily agree you know we always agree we never sort of um a compromise is inevitably reached even if we disagree on something so um, I'd love to hear from Michelle and Lucas about your responses to the material. I don't know if it was the screenplay that you encountered first or if it was Patrick's novel, but um, I, th I think it's such a, I think what's special about this film is this very unusual and sort of unpredictable tone that it has. It's, you know, surreal and dark and deadpan, but it's also heartfelt. And I think some of these changes even happen moment to moment, you know, and I'm just wondering how you responded to the material and then also how you approached um, playing those scenes um, as, as actors. Michelle, maybe we could start with you. Um, okay, well, um, I, I mean, it's, it is, it's, it is, it definitely has both Patrick and, and Aza's stamp on this. And it's this sort of, you know, odd world filled with these odd people. And, you know, who are, um, I think it was Aza, you said they're sort of, in some ways, likened to people marooned on an island who end up finding each other. Um, but it's also what I love about both uh, Patrick's writing and, and Oz's, um, Oz's direction is that it's these, you know, what could, what could, and in some ways um, on the page seem, could be caricature, caricature-ish, and yet both of them have this ability and this knack for bringing you into these worlds that others, I know I, I know in this particular world, I knew, I had friends who grew up in this world, these sort of, um, you know, New, New York socialites, sort of the elite. And, you know, I'm a girl from Orange County, California. And so um, I always felt sort of weirdly outside. And no matter how, and especially when they all got together as a group, um, and I somehow always felt very pedestrian, you know, when I was around them, but you somehow managed to get, you know, bring people in and bring you inside and, and, um, uh, make them, you know, three dimensional in a way. And then you realize that all of us are really, whether it's Terry, whether it's French exit, 
you know, you couldn't really get polar opposites really in those two worlds. And it's like you, 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 you realize that we're all really living in our own little bubble. And, um, and depending on what bubble you grew up, you grew up in, you develop certain survival skills and they're different and um, depending on what your experience has been. And um, so I, um, I read the script first, immediately followed it up with the novel. And I mean, I just felt, I was like, Oz, it was like halfway through, I was sort of like, I'm in. Um, because you just know when something is really special, you know, because it doesn't come along all that often. For me, I, I think uh, the reason why I love being in movies from, from a young age was because I've just fallen in love with stories and, and worlds and, and the different rules that accompany them. And uh, I, I had a very distinct feeling of, this is a world that I love and a voice that I love. And when I, I felt that way in the first like 10 pages of the script and, and I've said this before that like my standard for scripts is getting kind of or what I expect from scripts is kind of getting lower and lower and, and I'm a little pessimistic about the kinds of stuff I've been sent but this really from it, it was clear pretty early on that it was it was completely different and of course that's because of Patrick and, and his, his voice as a writer um, and so I, I was I was just really taken by by the the ways in which the characters thought and spoke and i there there's there one thing in particular about malcolm that i loved which is that there there's something that that patrick wrote which is that sometimes when he's processing like thoughts or or when he's listening he says like he says like all right or okay like while he's taking in somebody else's like monologue, like there's this scene with Boris Morris where he is just sort of, he's listening to him and, and, and just like, just that little piece is so unique and different. And, and it's already just like, like, like all I need is just, it is, is just like one moment in every scene that's, that's unique and different and, and, and like idiosyncratic in a way that feels true to, to human nature to me and that that's like ev every scene is that with in Patrick's writing so there's that so I, I loved the script and then and then I got to meet Aza and that was like a, per a perfect marriage because he's such like a humanist director and artist and was able to um, I think is a great compliment to my over overly neurotic brain, especially as an actor. Sometimes I, have a t I can approach things from the outside in and he always brought me back down to, to, to earth with, with his, his heart and his ability to sort of be like, when have you felt like this before? And, and, and even in the first meeting, you know, I remember really opening up about stuff going on in my family and, and things that I was struggling with in my life. And, and he was like, just so you know, the more I get to know you, the more I'll be able to to just sort of offer you things from the 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 uh, from what you've shared about where you're vulnerable and and it felt it, it he he offered that in a way that felt very generous and and like the epitome of of how I want to be um, a director to be sensitive to me and and so it it, it really felt like you know I love this world I love the character I love Patrick's creative imagination. And and Aza is just such a generous human and artist. So it was it was really not no question. We have some questions coming in. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start with one from Nathaniel uh, Brimmer Bella or Film Days, uh, massive fan of the book. Um, he says it struck me that the casting of every part was pitch perfect um, for the living breathing version of the text, right on down to small Frank. Uh, what was the casting process like? Um, if Aza, if you want to say a little bit about that. Um, yeah, well, it definitely, it began with, with Michelle, uh, the moment that she responded and said that she was up for making this together. Then it was the process of, going, of really figuring out how this works as a family. And I worked very closely with my casting director, Nicola Busto. But we really try to think of like everybody, again, going back to this island of lonely people 
collecting and becoming less lonely as they find each other? How do they all relate? And so uh, with Michelle and, and Michelle, you know, like all the actors, I was from the moment that Michelle said, yes, we started having a conversation of just this world and it helped inform me in a great way in terms of thinking, okay, just getting to understand her and a little bit of the, the way that she was seeing the world, how other, how Malcolm could be, how Malcolm could fit with the Francis that I felt like she was starting to reveal to me. Um, I had seen, I'd gone and seen the Waverly Gallery and though obviously Lucas played somebody very different in that play, I did walk away thinking like, and, and also because Malcolm was written older, I hadn't even been thinking in this direction until I saw the Waverly Gallery and, I, and was a fan already, but saw something, I, I don't know, I was, I was deeply touched by the play and brought up the idea to Lucas, to Pat, and we were thinking like, oh, if there's anybody at that age that could bring that world and that kind of understanding to Malcolm, it would be Lucas, just based on the work that he had done um, in the past. And, and suddenly, it did interesting things to the story as well. Like just having um, Malcolm at a different age in terms of just like, just what that meant for his future, especially towards the end of the film. Um, and so, and, and it, Lucas and I met and then we started kind of building this family from here and then moving on to Imogen and figuring out, oh, Imogen worked perfectly with, it made sense in terms of, uh, with Lucas and just it was really kind of the, the same process as when you're figuring out any elements in a film but spe spe specifically in this one of just how to balance and how to contrast each other and what kind of interesting sparks would come from these actors but most of all I think I think just sitting down with each of the actors and seeing that they had proven themselves many many times over in their lives as actors but they still were hungry and still were interested and still were questioning and curious, that was something that I really connected with and felt like, okay, this is the type of people that I would like to be around and, and want to work with. So it was, it was a balancing and it was like a tree starting really from with Michelle. It's, it's such an eclectic, wonderfully eclectic cast. Did you feel like you were working with many different approaches and styles in terms of acting? Yeah, they, they, all of them worked very, very differently than each other, but it was all, it, it was, it, and you'd kind of shift into, it was, I guess, a bit of being like a shapeshifter in terms of figuring out what, it, what dialogue you're having with each actor, but maybe it's always like that, but it definitely felt like, specifically because we had this book that was something that we were really embracing. We, we loved the book and we were using that as, conversations of what backstories of things that have happened we use it as things that whether it wound up in the script or not actually happened in these lives so I was having conversations I think with every actor that had a, a really maybe deeper insight on what had happened to their character than usually with most scripts so yeah um, a question from Adriano Ercolani of Coming Soon. I guess, I guess this is for all of you. Um, which was the most challenging scene to shoot in an emotional sense? Mm. An emotional sense, yeah. I mean, I can, can I start with the actors? <laughs> they <are> the <laughs> actors first. I know what was the most challenging for you, Aza. Tell me. Yeah. There was how about eight pages or something. Not really the end, but it was the. Um, anyway, I'm gonna let you answer it. <laughs> you mean like when everybody's all together? Yeah. yeah. But that was an emotional. I, I think everybody understood. Like that felt clear where people were coming from, but the yeah. mechanics of how people could be moving throughout this this room and keep uh, things escalating. That and I worked very closely, just obviously with the actors, but also I really want to give credit to my cinematographer, Tobias Datum, as well, in terms of just figuring out how to keep this energy and people moving and using the space as the best way we could. So that was like on a mechanical way, I think the most uh, challenging 
uh, on emotional, I definitely know that moment for me at least with uh, between Malcolm and Francis at the end in the kitchen, which also was one of the last scenes that we were shooting of the film. I was was a lot for me. I mean, it was, it was I, I, I felt it, I, I feel it in the film, but I, definitely on set, it was one of these um, scenes that had a big impact while we're shooting. Um, I'm trying to think for myself. I, uh, uh, the, 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 this, there was a, a scene we had to reshoot because I um, shaved my facial hair. Um, without asking and I was like a bad boy for it and Aza never disciplined me he was never hard on me it's not nobody made me feel bad but I had this brilliant idea that I was going to shave my facial hair and approach the scene in a different way and because I wanted to show up fresh for Susan and we shot this scene that we then had to reshoot because I had to grow back my facial hair to match it um, and it was the, I'm happy we had to reshoot it because I was very confused when we shot it the first time. It was the morning after when uh, mm -hmm. Francis disappears and I'm sort of sitting at the dining room table and Susan's there paying close attention to, to my emotional state. And I didn't know what I was doing in that moment. And I think I kept trying to find an emotional truth or it was, but it was almost like the more I searched for the emotional truth, the more on point the moment became. And, and maybe it wasn't about me knowing exactly what it was. And, and I, I, I think um, that the beauty of good writing is that to some extent, all you need to do is show up in your physical form and within it, the, the story, you can sort of project onto the people, whatever you, if you really belong there, you fit. And I think when we got to shoot it again, I was, I was grateful because I think I, I felt like I belonged. I felt like I belonged in the moment, but that in general, that moment I did, I was, I was baffled by, maybe that's too strong of a word. I just didn't know exactly what I was doing. And I think that was also part of that. That's probably exactly what the, the character was going through. That's like what we say, what we like to tell ourselves as actors when we have no idea what we're doing. Um, but, um, but uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was, um, it, it was a moment that, that I, I uh, made, made me really wonder and question, you know, how do I do what I'm supposed to do as an actor? And uh, but I, I do remember feeling comfortable, com comfort when we finished it. So something worked out. Me? Michelle, yes. Um, I know, well, it's, it's interesting because um, the scene that, that Oz is referring to is probably the most emotional, but it was at the very end of shooting and by that time you know you're so immersed in it and um it actually was one of the easiest things for me um it's almost like channeling you know and um i think that so but i so i think that most difficult for me would have been the scene in the kitchen and the knife sharpening scene but mainly because it was, because of the technicality issues we were having, because we just kept losing lights, we kept losing like we kept losing power, we kept, and when you're doing those kinds of scenes, and it was the beginning of shooting too, so you haven't really found your footing, you know, and and um, um, still sort of trying to figure the character out, and um. um and tiny space and we just you know you kind of get this is this is the worst thing for an actor is when you're you finally feel like you you're getting there wherever that is and then you shoot and then you're riding that crest and it's happening and then a plane flies over or dolly creaks or somebody sneezes or you know something happens and it it sort of disrupts your momentum and i think it was one of those days and i felt like 
it was a constant having to get back. I mean, it just happens. It just happens in films, you know, on every movie. It, and we were lucky because it very rarely happened with us. It was such an easy shoot. But for me, those kinds of when I would say when they're the most emotionally difficult or when it's the elements in some way, whether we're shooting outside, like when we were shooting the park scene with mm -hmm. the homeless man, you know, just sort of dealing with elements you kind of can't control and you're freezing and you're uncomfortable and those kinds of things where they, you know, everything that wants to sort of just take you out of the moment. I really felt like after that scene that you were, I really felt like you were my mom after the kitchen scene. Like I really like, I, I felt like I, I didn't know you. And then in that scene, after that scene, I was in love with you. I really was like, I was so, you won me over completely. And I'm so happy it was in the first like week because I mean, I, we, I needed that early. Well, you won me over at hello, so there. <laughs> Um, Patrick, were you on the set? Did you want to weigh in on this question? In terms of uh, I just did. I was there for the knife. Wait, was I there for the, I wasn't there for the knife scene. I was there. I spent a week in Montreal um, lurking and uh, observing. And I don't think I necessarily witnessed any problematic situations. Uh, I just, but for an outsider, for somebody who doesn't know film that well, um, it's remarkable the amount of work and how difficult it is to get something right. So it was just, I stepped away from it admiring all the people involved, but also sort of pleased in a way at the relative simplicity of novel writing, you know, which is you can do in your pajamas. Um, it was a really, in short, it was, I think the novelist of a film, when a film's being made of a novel, I think the novelist approaches the set with a certain sense of what am I going to see and how is it going to make me feel and it was really a relief to step into their world and watch what they were doing and I already trusted Aza, uh, admired Michelle and Lucas but it just seemed to be working to me. The sense I had right off the bat was okay this is um, I was pleased you know in, in this in this really deep way and it was comforting to see that they really seemed to really get it Michelle and Lucas really got understood the characters. Oz understood them. And there was a lot of love for the characters, I sensed, for all the characters in the making of the film, which is sort of a hallmark of uh, Oz's work generally, just respect for human, human beings. So I was pleased by it. I will say, though, actually, this, the first night I got there was the scene with the confetti throwing. And that was when all the people are dancing on the ship. Um, and I remember that seemed like a bit of a headache, frankly. It was a long night. Yeah. A long yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. A question for, um, for Michelle from Keith Whittier of, of Ottawa Life. Um, is this the most fun you've had in a while? Because it seemed like it in your performance. Oh, what a nice thing to say. Yes, actually. Um, I would definitely put it up there. My definitely my top five of wonderful filmmaking experiences. Definitely, yeah. I mean, I loved working. The cast was so extraordinary. It, everything, the writing. You know, when you get that kind of writing, it just it starts there. That you're not struggling with it, and you're just it sort of carries you. You know, you're not having to like work it or um and uh and then working with aza and you know the concern for me having read the, the novel and the script obviously was the tone was so specific and yet really hard to describe and that was my big concern was but this has to be like exactly right it's wrong so quickly and and I knew that immediately that, you know, Aza just hit it on the head. And um, so it was, um, I did. We worked hard, you know, when you're doing a, 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 like a, a smaller independent film and you're on a really tight budget and you're on a really tight schedule. And um, everybody, though, we worked hard and long, and but we laughed a lot and we had a lot of fun. And um, 
was uh, it was good. Uh, Stephen Schaefer of the Boston Herald wants to know if the two actors talked about what happened during the decade after um, Francis picks Malcolm uh, from school at age 12 to when we meet him as an adult. Was, were, were the events that you invented for yourselves? Not in a specific way. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll let you do that, Lucas. <laughs> I think we did a lot. I or I, mean, I don't. I, I think I talked about uh, with Aza a lot. I actually, because most of what Malcolm's whole thing is like, he's just completely. It's he, there's this incredible flashback in the book that sort of lays out Malcolm's entire inner world um, and, and who, who he's, what he's like as a person and what he's longing for. And we did do a lot of, th th there also is in the book, some stuff we couldn't get, get in, the, in the, the, the movie, a sense of the, the relationship he's had with the homeschool teachers and, and how his mom has influenced his ability to have relationships with anybody outside of uh, outside of her. Um, so most of it was there. Uh, pretty much all of it was there, actually. And then it was just sort of about um, allowing that to become the history. But I don't. I don't think I thought much about it with with um, Michelle because I, I think that makes sense too. I don't think Francis or Malcolm would have. Uh, mm -hmm would actually I, I get the sense when they're when they're together they're actually just really together I don't think they're they're actually rehashing um a lot of I, I don't I, I think they're actually really capable of being present despite their sort of really bizarre dynamic so it makes sense that that it was something me and Aza kept between us yeah you were withholding from me um a pair of questions. A pair of questions for Michelle. Um, Diana Drum says, "You mentioned knowing people like Francis and Malcolm, that New York set. Did you draw on anyone in particular to research and build a character?" Uh, and Bill McCuddy at All Arts is wondering if you spent any time on the Upper East Side studying some of the women who live there. Well, I think just throughout my life, you know, I've known women who um, like. Um, it was probably more, um, well, some peers that, um, of mine and then, and then when I was younger, it would have been the mothers of my, 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 my friends. Um, it wasn't any one particular person. I would say it's sort of a compilation of a lot of people. Um, and I, you know, worked on some specific, um, dialects but there's one woman that I know that who will be unnamed that I who sort of speaks like this and you know so I just know a lot of women who are you know because being in uh being in the film industry I think there's some crossovers um um a lot of there's like a lot of um younger people from that world end up in our in our business so I, I um, you know, I've met people just over time. Um, we have several questions about the cat. Uh, Ken Foster from Baum wants to know if the cat was difficult to work with or a team player. Many compliments for the cat. Yeah, the cat, well, it's really the, the cat and the, the Wrangler. Um, amazing, because when they, I, and I remember Michelle and I having this discussion about how is this cat ever going, how is this, how is this going to work? Um, and I think you alerted to me that the, the idea of a trained cat doesn't exist. But uh, it turned out that she had a relationship, I can't remember, uh, I can't remember her name, but she was wonderful and she... Um, her name was Josie. Josie, okay, great. Yes, Josie, and she had this uh, cat. She had actually a couple. There's, I mean, hopefully this is not a spoiler. There's a different cat who does the scratch because that cat that we were working with was too, was too gentle to do something like that. 
Um, what we learned, we shot the, one of the earliest things that we shot of the cat was running up the stairs. That's pretty early on in the film. And it, the cat would not go in the direction that they had rehearsed, go up the stairs, would go in every other direction. And it just turned, and this, is, this seems really <laughs> obvious in retrospect, but it turns out that a cat works on their own time. And, but I, we were trying to get the cat working on our time in the beginning and just thinking, okay, we have, let's just rush this thing, which wound up shooting and shooting and shooting and not working. Um, and then we realized talking to Josie that if we just all stepped away and really just everybody walk away from the set and let the cat get comfortable and practice and just be ready, then we could shoot it. And it wasn't this kind of situation where you're going, spending a lot of time. It's just, we'd get back, Josie would come back and say, okay, the cat's ready for whatever is going on. Um, and then uh, the cat would be ready to do it. So it was a little bit of like that first day of cat stuff being unusable and then realizing this. And, but then in the end, the cat got so comfortable around us. I mean, that really is the cat underneath the park bench. It really was raining that day. I don't know how, that's possible still. Um, and the cat that goes, gets put into the purse too. I mean, in the, in the ship, that is a, that's an actual cat too. I don't think that it's so crazy. Yeah. Yeah. The reason I remember that her name was it you, Aza, or was it I who, uh, Josie and the Pussycats, you know this? That's right. Yeah. That's <laughs> Josie and the Pussycats was a c cartoon that was big in the late seventies, early eighties. And the cat wrangler's name was Josie. And I said, Hey, Josie and the Pussycats. And she said, what? And I said, Josie and the Pussycats, you know, like the show. And she'd never heard of it. And I thought, your name's Josie. You're a cat wrangler. You've oh. never heard of Josie and the Pussycats. OK. <laughs> That's great. We're, we're just about out of time, but I'm just going to squeeze in one, one last question, um, because I think it, it sort of speaks to the achievement of the, of the film. And I think it's something that um, maybe all of you could address. It's from Peter Rinaldi, Filmmaker Magazine. A lot of the film is funny, but in a way that doesn't feel constructed as humor. And if you could speak to your approach to comedy um i guess any of you could weigh into it on on this um i will just jump in and say that i think that i think of comedy as a tool a coping tool primarily and i think that i have an impulse to tell dramatic stories and yet my addiction to this tool is so pronounced that i can't not tell dramatic stories through the lens of the comedic or the ridiculous it's um it's something that i come to without really thinking of it and i don't necessarily need it as a reader or as a viewer i don't i don't have an issue with thoroughly dramatic works but whenever i sit down to work uh it's something i used to struggle against when i was younger and at a certain point i gave up worrying about it this is just the way i i'm inclined to tell stories so it's something that comes naturally something I don't really think of anymore. It's just what happens. And I think that the, the writing itself was funny. So there was never a conversation with the actors on how to make this funny. Um, it just, how to make this true, how to be true to this material, but true to these characters, because that humor was already there. And so it was really trying to find what the ground was in this surreal world. Um, and in this humor and just make sure that these are still breathing humans that are struggling with human issues, even with the humor. You know, and I think that is also what makes the writing so authentic and so real is that I have found in my life in the most dire situations or when sometimes people are at their funniest. And and you know when, when my father died and when my mother died and it's it is it's sort of a it's a way that people release it's a um it is a defense mechanism and yet you know i had an acting teacher who used to say okay how you know how would you behave in this situation and then listen and then and then then he would say to you okay now how would you really behave in this situation <laughs> It's always different, you know, you're, you're, in, and I think that, um, so to me, that is not unusual. I think it's what makes it, it's so, it's so real, actually. Yeah. 
Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think there's there's comedy's really a mystery to me on some level, but I also just think there's nothing funny about about the idea of being funny or about like as a concept, it doesn't make any sense. It's it's. I, I did hear this good quote the other day that Buster Keaton said, which was comedians um, uh, like, like uh, they do funny things and great comedians do things funny. And I think what, what that indicates to me is that it's always a reflection of how you're, it's, it's more so a, ref, of a, a reflection, I think, of how they live and what they're trying to do and the humor comes from that sort of genuine, the genuine impulse within that. Um, like I, I always think I'm funniest when I least want to be funny, and and my friends are always laughing at me the most when I, when I like haven't slept or look terrible and I'm searching for my phone, and and at the same time I have this understanding of myself as being somewhat of an important person who shouldn't be laughed at. Um, and, and within that, something really funny starts to happen to me. So, uh, I, I, I guess what, I, now to round it back to French Exit, um, I don't know, I think he's just a great writer and there's a lot of funny stuff in it. Like, I, I, I don't know, I almost, I don't know how to, hopefully there's some answer in there. Great. Um, that was wonderful. Uh, I want to thank all of you so much uh, for joining us and okay. congratulations um, on this amazing film. Thank you for being part of the festival. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for having us part of the festival. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you.